Okay. Are we in that? Are we, are we good? Okay. So um, what I would like to talk about a little bit is um, so now, okay, is the diversity of the southeastern United States. So the southeastern U.S. has kind of extraordinary plant and animal diversity. And I want to talk just briefly about why we have that. So if we look at plant species diversity, why do we have the bar there? Um, so the, um, the, um, the southeastern United States looks pretty extraordinary. Uh, California is also good. If we look at plant family diversity, if we jump up to the taxonomic level of plant family, it changes kind of remarkably. And we have really high uh, plant family diversity in the southeastern US. And that is because we are this ancient relictual area of plant diversity that has held on to diversity for tens of millions, even a hundred million years through past climate changes um, and so forth. So that can give us hope for the future as well. If we, we look at uh, tree diversity, everyone talks about Great Smoky Mountains. Well, um, Great Smokies is here. It's really all about South Carolina and Georgia and especially the Red Hills of Alabama with uh, the highest actually tree diversity in the southeastern United States. If we look at the paleo dicots, this is the sort of ancient lineages of things like magnolias and water lilies and, and uh, laurels and so forth. We also see this tremendous diversity of the southeastern U.S., um, zero members of this uh, major plant lineage in, in various parts of the West. Um, so tremendous diversity. Well, you think, okay, the grasses, the grasses has got to be the Great Plains, right? That's where all the grasses are. Well, grass diversity also extremely high across the southeastern United States, uh, particularly the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coastal Plain. And then, um, you know, we don't want to be totally plantist, right? Uh, Keith, I mean, come on. Can't we let some animals in? So amphibians. So um, tremendous diversity in the southeastern United States, uh, both in the mountains and in the coastal plain. And, you know, the Piedmont isn't chopped liver either. Um, amphibian endemics, really high and all. So why do we have all this diversity? So we have, I like to talk about this in terms of, of kind of the the old fashioned Roman elements of, of earth, air, fire, and water. So we have a lot of diversity of each of those in the Southeastern United States. We have um, this physiographic diversity that has, has emerged over hundreds of millions of years of continents colliding and continents moving apart and mountain ranges being thrown up and mountain ranges eroding. We have a lot of geologic diversity. Yeah, I know that's not South Carolina. I know that's Alabama. But we have a lot of geologic diversity in all the states of the Southeast um, with sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks and, and uh, unconsolidated sediments. We have elevation uh, variation, which acts as kind of a surrogate for temperature and climate. So South Carolina doesn't have the tallest mountains in the world, but it does have some diversity, um, right? And, uh, and, that, and we also have diversity of rainfall. And uh, we're not very far here from the, the, the wet hot spot of Eastern North America, uh, that area along the North Carolina, South Carolina border uh, of the East Atoe, uh, Whitewater, Thompson, et cetera, the gorge country up there with 110, 120 inches of rain a year which is about triple what uh, Columbia gets. Um, so um, essentially temperate rainforest kind of conditions. We also have um, a lot of fire as a factor that shapes the communities and vegetation and habitats of the Southeastern United States. So this is a, a um, lightning strike map. Uh, well, no, this is actually a fire return map and all of the deep oranges and reds mean that in the natural landscape, in, in drier parts of the natural landscape, fire would have returned once every two or three years, four years maybe at most, um, even more frequently down in Florida and parts of Texas. So we have fire as a uh, kind of diversifier of the landscape. 
Areas that burn uh, create uh, habitat for some plants. Areas that don't burn create habitats for other uh, plants. And then, um, and then sort of we have all of these earth, air, fire, water sort of filtered through the crazy clock of time and climate change. Climate change is not a new thing. Uh, the, the, the world and South Carolina have been through lots of climate change in the past. You all know the Pleistocene glaciation. No, we didn't have glaciers in South Carolina, but boy, we had different climate here. We had spruce trees in the Piedmont. We had, um, you know, very different conditions, um, tundra-like conditions at the, at the top of the escarpment um, in, in South Carolina. And so uh, that crazy clock of time sort of shifts plants and animals around. It kind of provides both uh, an opportunity for colonization and then also a, uh, on the negative side, for local extinction and extirpation of, 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 of organisms um, in the region. And so um, the southeastern coastal plain is this kind of biodiversity hotspot. The southeast as a whole is the biodiversity hotspot. But Reed Noss and, and I and colleagues uh, wrote a paper back, gosh, has it been nine years ago? I guess it was, 2014. I can't argue with that date, right? Um, so uh, we wrote a paper that um, where we basically proposed the southeastern U.S., the coastal plain specifically, as a um, as a unrecognized hotspot. It was subsequently recognized as a hotspot um, of biodiversity, a, a globally significant biodiversity hotspot. Um, and uh, the coastal plain. We're here in upstate, so we won't talk. Uh, quite as much about the coastal plain, but I, um, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, um, okay, so um, shifting gears a little bit, what I, um, I also wanna talk about is the process of, of uh, floras, of how we recognize that biodiversity, how we document it, how we make it useful to people and so forth. And so uh, the title of my talk, it's not your grand, grandfathers, and I did choose father sort of deliberately because most of the floras that uh, traditionally have been written have been written by men. Um, that is changing to some degree, but it is not your grandparents' taxonomy. Um, we continue to, um, to study these plants. We continue to explore. We find new species. We describe them. We um, lump some species, we split some species. This is where the rotten tomatoes come out, right? Um, and, um, and all. So um, it's also not your grandparents' flora, meaning the set of plants that are in an area. Uh, do we have the same plants here um, in South Carolina in 2023 that we had, say, in 1968 when Radford, Alice, and Bell wrote the, the Manual of the Vascular Flora of the Carolinas that was such a sort of monumental work that was kind of the, the Bible for uh, botanists for uh, many decades. Do we have the same flora that was here 100 years ago or 200 years ago? No, um, and I'll talk about that. Um, so um, that to me translates to it shouldn't also be uh, your grandparents' flora, a book, or nowadays an app about the set of plants in an area. We have to modernize, we have to improve, we have to um, reflect the changes that have occurred in the flora and our understanding of it and serve that uh, to the public. Um, it's also not your grandparents' keys and methods of identification. We have new ways to identify plants that we didn't used to have. How many of y'all have used uh, iNat, iNaturalist, and taken a picture of a, of, of a plant and it says, we think what you are looking at is Heliopsis helianthoides, right? Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, crazy stuff that, uh, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I couldn't have imagined. I think I'm going to contend that we also have a different audience for biodiversity information than we had in the past. Floras, um, big fat tomes, you know, that um, were 1,200 pages long and had 
uh, lots and lots of fine print and maybe no illustrations or anything like that. You know, they were written by university professors for university professors. I'll just state that kind of bluntly, you know. Um, and uh, can we get away with doing that anymore? Is that the right thing for us to do? I don't think so. Um, and um, it's not your grandparents' conservation mission or lack thereof. Um, when, for instance, the Radford Allison Bell Manual was published in 1968, there was no Endangered Species Act. There was the word biodiversity had not been coined. Uh, there was kind of no, almost no level of concern about, oh, um, these plants in South Carolina have become rare. And if we don't do something soon, they're gonna be gone from our state. And should we care about that? Um, et cetera. And I will, I will assert that I think we have, a, um, we have a society and a set of people who now care about those things and we need to address that. So um, before we pass on from our grandparents and, and uh, their generation, I thought I would show you all some sort of fun historical photos. These are from the the UNC Herbarium's um, archive. Al Radford there is on the left with the pith helmet and the khakis. Um, I, I, uh, he was a mentor of mine when I was an undergraduate. He never went into the field uh, in anything other than khaki, in full khakis and a pith helmet. Um, he spent World War II in North Africa and he adopted that as his sort of um, style of being in the field and he kept it up. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, Ford uh, Model T or A, I'm not sure which, that, uh, that W.C. Coker bought for uh, Al and Lori Radford uh, to, to give credit to uh, both genders. Lori Radford was the second uh, curator of the UNC Herbarium after W.C. Coker. Al Radford was the third. So um, Lori married her student effectively. Um, she, she was there before Al Radford was. So there's Al standing in the trailer to hold all the plant presses um, hauled behind the vehicle. And here are Al and Lori with uh, vasculums and um, shovels and buckets and various other things and, and very stylish job pours um, and um, Al cooking uh, cooking a meal and uh, Lori cooking a meal. So um, anyway, all right, so um, I want to move on to uh, these sort of themes. Change in the plants of a region, our understanding of, of them and the names we apply. What plants should be included in a flora? Floras as scholarly tomes versus practical tools for science, outreach, and conservation. Floras as sources of authority versus floras as engaging generators of knowledge. Um, I think we also need to kind of approach things in a different way. And then I'm gonna talk about the Southeastern Flora Project and flora tools that we're developing. So what should be included in um, a flora, in a book that documents a book or an app or whatever that documents all of the plants that occur in an area, and we will say South Carolina for some kind of random reason, right? Um, so, by the way, a couple of weeks ago, I was down at Polly's Island where my wife's um, uh, father lives, and there was this football game going on. It was like Carolina versus Carolina, and I and the people around me seemed to have a different idea about, about what was meant by the word Carolina. Um, you know, to me, Carolina is pale blue. When I, I was in my 20s sometime after I had attended the University of North Carolina, which I called Carolina as an undergraduate, before I realized that people in South Carolina used Carolina to mean something different. I mean, I was really sort of flummoxed and frankly, a little scandalized about the idea of it. Anyway, we'll leave that aside. I, I have a I maintain a friendly relationship with all y'all. Um, 
Okay, so what should be included in a flora? Traditionally, all native species and non-natives that are naturalized, meaning something like thoroughly established, but originally coming from a different area. Well, you know, you immediately sort of run into some questions there. How thoroughly is thoroughly? How do we determine that? Um, and, and all. But floras are where the rubber meets the road. It's where, put it, where we put taxonomic science in the hands of users. And I think we need to sort of redefine what's included in a flora. Clive Stace, um, in his uh, British Flora of 1991, wrote the following, and I thought it, you know, it's kind of a different view of what should be in a flora, and I, and I think it's kind of brilliant. Um, so he writes, the flora is designed to enable field botanists and those working with herbarium specimens to identify plants that are found in the wild in the British Isles. This is, I believe, a new criterion. More usually, the origin and performance of plants are given higher significance when deciding where to draw the line between those to be included and those to be excluded. However, when one encounters a plant, it is often not possible to know whether it is native or alien or whether it has arrived accidentally or been planted. And one cannot know whether it will be there next year, um, whether it's established or not. Hence, a pragmatic approach has been adopted. So I've also taken that kind of approach. And that is that if you encounter a plant on a roadside, it's not obvious that it's been planted. Um, you're not, you don't know whether it's gonna persist there or not. Um, that plant should be included because um, somebody is going to want to identify it and and the flora is the tool to do that with. So um, so changes in the flora, there are changes of different sorts. There are actual changes in the flora. And uh, one uh, source of that is new species being discovered and named. And um, I hope most of you all realize this, but I think to the to the general public, it is a mystery that new species get named in South Carolina and North Carolina and Alabama and all, all the time. Um, that is not just taking place in Borneo or the Amazon jungle or the Andes mountains or some remote place um, somewhere in the tropics. We are still doing the basic work of figuring out what plants and animals are here right in our backyards, right? So um, this is a very partial list of new species that have been named in South Carolina. And many of y'all will recognize some of these names like Ambrosia, it's not Porcheri, it's Pachei. Um, so I guess many of y'all probably are familiar with Richard Pachei. Uh, Micranthes pedialaris varshelii, Hexastylus sorii, Lobelia batsonii. Um, Eupatorium paludicola, a new species of helianthus that's in the process of being named, Carex red fortii, even Euthania weeklii, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are literally uh, more than 100 species that have been named, newly named in South Carolina over the last few decades uh, that were not known um, to be here. So native species newly described. So a few of those include things like the Sandhills endemic, Hexastylus sorii, the sandhill heartleaf or sori's heartleaf, Lobelia batsonii, the streamhead Lobelia, um, named for Wade Batson of, of great South Carolina botany fame. Uh, so there are also actual changes in the flora that represent non-natives naturalizing in recent decades. So invasive weeds, weeds to be. Um, so calorie dam pear. Um, pardon my language, uh, but, you know, not on anybody's radar a few decades ago, uh, but whoa, you know, is that like a major uh, plant uh, invading um, fields, abandoned pastures, roadsides, um, et cetera. Uh, Fatua villosa, if any of you all garden, you probably know this plant, foolish weed or mulberry weed. How many of you all know Fatua? Yeah. Um, Acaranthes japonica variety Hachijoensis, that's on the way, um, has moved into North Carolina from the Ohio River Basin. Um, and just to give us a little time uh, perspective about this, 
good old Ligustrum sinensi, probably the, arguably the worst weed in the southeastern United States, the worst uh, non-native species in terms of the millions of acres that it now dominates um, and all. Small, in his 1933 manual, 90 years ago, he said, occurs as an escape in southern Louisiana. How that has changed, you know, that has spread across the entire southeast as a major dominant plant. So um, when we look at, um, at these um, non-natives, uh, 296 uh, new non-natives established in the Carolinas. Actual changes in the flora, uh, non-natives not yet fully naturalized. I think these are important for us to consider. These are sort of the, this is kind of the warning list. This is the, the, um, the things that are on the way to becoming the next calorie pair or the next microstegium, uh, et cetera. So a lot of these are common horticultural plants that have started moving into kind of suburban woodlands. You know, if you go to some neighborhood in Columbia or Greenville and go out in the backyard and see what is establishing um, and all, these are those kind of plants. Um, some of those non-natives are also rare weeds that have only been collected a few times and maybe not recently. Um, an interesting example of those are all the wool plant aliens that Harry Ollies collected in the 1950s. They seem to be like, okay, so what is a wool plant? We don't even know what these things are anymore. A wool plant was where they got wool from Australia or Italy or Argentina or um, Wyoming. And um, in coastal plain of South Carolina, they would comb that wool and get all the foreign matter out of it, all the dirt and seeds and things like that. And what would they do with the dirt and the seeds? They'd throw it out the back door. Uh, so what would those seeds do out the back door? They would germinate and, uh, and so forth. So we would end up with plants uh, that are native to Australia or the Falkland Islands or um, Spain or California. Uh, growing in the coastal plain of South Carolina. Now, a lot of those plants, they said, ooh, South Carolina, way too humid. This is no fun. We're just going to die. Um, but not all of them did that. And um, Keith Bradley and, and some others have, uh, have recently turned up some, um, some weeds that have really spread, are spreading uh, rapidly um, through, the, uh, through the southeast that originated probably from sources like that. Um, so, um, you know, another example of this that wasn't on the radar a few decades ago, uh, Janie Marlowe has been a, a champion about this, Ficaria verna, um, uh, fig buttercup. Um, so Fernald in 1950 called it an old garden plant occasionally spreading to waste places or open woods and locally established. Cronquist in 1991 in the Northeastern Flora said, casually escaped from cultivation in our range. Um, but that picture on the lower left shows what a lot of floodplains up in Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania and New York now look like with, with no plant present except for Ficaria, just a complete monoculture of Ficaria out competing all of our native plants. So um, it's important that we learn to recognize some of these plants that are um, beginning to become invasive or becoming invasive, um, the sooner we recognize them, the more we actually are able to do something effective about controlling them. I always thought that it was a little bit perverse that floras uh, don't include common cultivated plants, including crop plants. So if you go to the flora of the Great Plains, wheat is not included. I'm like, really? Um, does that make sense to the common user of a flora? Maybe some academic says, well, weed is not really fully established in Kansas. It doesn't grow spontaneously without the help of humans. But if you're somebody who's interested in plants and you live in Kansas, um, for wheat to be ignored seems like a perverse um, thing. So I think that um, some of those plants ought to be included. Um, so um, state records, um, you know, kind of new distributions within the region are things that um, 
that uh, pop up. And these examples aren't uh, appropriate for South Carolina, but um, about 6% of the flora of the Carolinas, um, for instance, in South Carolina represent plants that weren't known to be here um, in 1968 or 1978. Uh, but are known to be here now because of the good work of, of field biologists and people like yourselves. Um, and a great example of that that is uh, pertinent to the upstate here are these three ferns uh, that were um, discovered uh, just a few years ago uh, growing on a uh, rock cliff um, at Lake Chipcassi, uh, these three southwestern uh, species of ferns, Astrolepis, Sinueta, uh, Bomeria hispida, and Pelea ridiana, um, and all. So um, we don't know exactly how or when these species got here, but here they are. Um, they're part of the flora now, um, and uh, therefore should be concluded. So um, back to naming new species. Uh, most species were named under what species concept, what did we, what were we thinking? What is a, what, what causes us to say this is a different species than this? Well, the species concept under which, which mo most species were named was the typological species concept. And that is that species are unchanging types placed on earth by God. God gave Adam the, the task, uh, read your Genesis, uh, gave Adam the task of naming them. Um, Eve probably did most of the work, but Adam got the credit. Um, and, and these plants were recognized um, by appearance. You know, it's like, okay, that looks different than that, so they're different species. Um, but um, in scientifically, we now operate under uh, a different species concept than that. Uh, we live in a world in which we believe in evolution, that evolution happened, that species were derived by evolutionary processes. And so we have different species concepts now that we apply and um, those make it both sort of easier and harder. Um, there's at least some criteria, um, but um, it, it's important for us to recognize that species do not evolve for the convenience of human taxonomists. Um, the, so we try to use all evidence to bring to bear um, you know, the species does not care about whether we recognize it or not. Um, if it is not, if, if it looks very similar to, but doesn't breed with the members of, of another species that it's very similar to, those still can be separate species. So we have different criteria that we use. So new species get named. Um, one example is Carex lutea which was discovered in 1991. It was described in 1994 by Richard LeBlond, um, a botanist up in North Carolina, and it was believed to be endemic to North Carolina. It was federally listed as an endangered species uh, that only occurred in um, just a handful of sites, a very specialized habitat. And then lo and behold, in 2021, we discovered it in South Carolina, Bob Dellinger, um, a, a botanist for the Forest Service, and in Florida um, and all. It's still a very rare plant. It's still federally listed, but we now know that this occurs in three states rather than one. So that's an illustration of the process of both describing new species and also doing the kind of exploration. So species change, uh, our idea of the flora changes also because of reassessments. And that is partly applying new standards and criteria to what we recognize as a species from what Linnaeus in 1753 might have recognized as a species. So we have lumping and splitting. And um, you'll notice that the percent of lumps and the percent of splits is quite different. It seems like there's a little bit of a bias going on there. It's a little bit of a, um, of a bias uh, that is um, working against a previous bias. So, um, so things go around in circles um, occasionally. There are um, sort of different scientific fads about that. There are also um, changes in plant names that are, um, that are necessary nomenclatural changes based on the code, the, um, the code of botanical nomenclature um, basically prescribes rules that um, determine what name applies 
Um, and so um, as an example of one of those, um, some of you all may have learned the, um, the common large buckeye tree of the mountains is Aeschylus octandra. Uh, that's what it was called in Radford Allison Bell. It's now called Aeschylus flava. That isn't actually a taxonomic change. That's simply a name change because it was found out, it was determined that Solander in 1778 named Aeschylus flava for this plant. Marshall was three years too late um, in giving his name. We thought this was the appropriate name to use, but then we discovered there was an earlier name and first wins in botanical nomenclature with a few, um, a few exceptions. So, um, but a lot of the changes that we see and the ones that uh, people throw rotten eggs and rotten tomatoes at me for, um, I'm usually just the messenger. I'm not usually, but anyway, I, you can throw ro the rotten stuff at me. But um, our genus assignment changes. And so back in 1991 or so, um, Guy Neeson, uh, a botanist at the University of North Carolina, said, yeah, Aster, as we've been using that name and applying it really widely to lots and lots of plants in Eastern North America, there's a problem here. Um, Aster, um, the Asters of North America are not like the Asters of Europe. The Asters of Europe uh, got the name first, so they win um, in retaining the name. The Asters in North America are multiple different lineages evolutionary lineages that have been separate from one another for millions of years, and they need to be recognized as separate genera. So we went from aster, two syllables and familiar and um, the same as a common name and all that, to things like Dolingiria and Eurydia and Ionactus and Theotricum um, and all. So, um, Et cetera. So lots of changes uh, caused by changes in our taxonomy at the genus level. And then there are rank changes where we move things up or down in rank um, and all. So these are also significant. So what this ends up with is that um, only a little bit over a third of the entire flora has gone through like the last 50 years without some kind of change. Quercus alba is still Quercus alba. Acer pensylvanicum is still Acer pensylvanicum. But um, by and large, lots and lots of things have changed. So this sort of summarizes all those changes. We probably don't need to um, go through that in detail because um, I have other things, other fish to fry this evening. Um, so um, we did go through a period that I call peak lump from about 1960 to the year 2000, in which um, there was kind of a scientific fad for, if we're not really, really sure that something is different, we're gonna lump it. And um, as we have developed new techniques like molecular techniques, as we've dug into really understanding these plants in more detail in the field, um, in the herbarium, in the lab, um, and so forth, what we have found is that a lot of the lumping that was done during this period was just flat wrong. So um, we are now correcting those. Um, and that means that some things are sort of coming back that were um, disregarded or whatever. So, um, you know, you would read in a scientific paper something like herbarium specimens of these two alleged species cannot be reliably distinguished. But remember, species do not evolve for the convenience of human taxonomists, and specifically, they don't evolve for the convenience of taxonomists in herbaria. And herbarium specimen is a wonderful thing. It's tremendously valuable for us, but it um, is a merely a um, you know one kind of representation of a real life plant, which has other characteristics that we can't determine from an herbarium specimen. So. Um, this is a, I wish I could get rid of that uh, darn bar at the bottom, but Caleb Cushing um, in 1817 wrote the following, and this is, I think, a, a good um, historical perspective. 
He's complaining about Thomas Nuttall's um, genera of North American plants published in 1817. And uh, Caleb Cushing writes, he has proposed above 60 new genera, chiefly by the subdivision of old genera. And we think here lies the greatest defect of the work, namely in a disposition to innovate upon the established genera, not always on the safest grounds, thus to make a new genus Commandra of Thaspium umbilatum and a genus Epiphagus of Borobanchi virginiana, in separating the genus Juglans into Juglans and Caria, in adopting... Thank you. <laughs> In, in adopting Desfontaines' dismemberment of the genus Convalaria into Convalaria smilocena and polygonatum, in confirming Michaud's and Persia's division of the genus Parola into Parola and Chimaphila, in these and in other instances that could be pointed out, Nuttall appears to us to have ventured upon or assented to changes which the generic differences he has indicated do not warrant and which materially injure the science of botany by embarrassing its nomenclature and impairing the symmetry of its arrangements. He was pissed. <laughs> so those of you who use scientific names, you will recognize that nearly all of those genera that he's complaining about are now completely accepted, right? So, um, so times change and, um, and we, well, now I can't change the slide. There's always something. Three dots give you a to control. Good. No. I am good, I guess. You should be able to hit your page up. Yeah, okay. So um, one of those changes that just came about in the last couple of months is um, Caligula going away. So this is kind of late breaking news. The genus Caligula um, will no longer occur in um, Southeastern United States. All members of it have been moved into uh, the genera Senega and Asamea. Um, by a, um, a recent paper. So um, floras and other flora tools and formats synthesize current information. Um, we need to take advantage of new technologies. Um, new generations have different expectations. Put the hay where the horses can get it. Um, so I look across the room and a lot of us, including myself, are are white haired um, and all we're used to sort of books, but I tell you my kids, you know, at age 20, if it's not available here, it's not available at all, right? So um, we could fight that. We could keep on publishing great big tomes of books and hoping that people will use them. Um, we do continue to do that, but I think we need to provide alternate means. So. Wild plants to the people. So, um, so the, the, a goal we have at the Southeastern Flora Project is essentially reinventing the flora as a 21st century for biodiversity inventory. Make it as easy as possible for a wide diversity of people to correctly identify and learn basic information about at least some of the 10,730 plant species in the Southeast. So uh, the flora that we're developing is current and frequently updated with the latest warranted taxonomy. You can download a new version of it every year. Um, it's completely crosswalked to other floras, monographs, checklists. So it connects to all the past information. It's conservation focused. We try to minimize the technical jargon in it. It's visual with photos and maps. A lot of the big tome floras uh, don't um, have those things um, and makes use of modern technology for, um, for uh, identification. So um, we do the hard work so you won't have to, or actually it's more like we try to give you better tools to make your hard work more effective, efficient, and fun. It's not, we haven't really gotten away from identifying plants still being pretty hard work. But here's the rest of the goal, and that is 
building a community of magi zoologists like Newt Scamander, um, of plant wizards, of data mages, of biodiversity explorers, of phytophilo philosophers, of conservation persuaders, transformational diversifiers, protectors of the real world, and just plain folks who care. The real world language I learned from my mom. Um, who liked plants and animals and, and nature and so forth. And she always basically said, that's the real world. The human world is the world of human artif artifice, you know, the, the shopping centers and the buildings and so forth. But the real world is the natural world. And um, I like that concept that... Um, that uh, it's the real world out there that we um, explore, that we um, need to conserve, and we need to increasingly persuade people to care about um, because um, we live in an increasingly suburbanized and urbanized world in which many of us uh, don't see a lot of green every day, or we see just kind of a green wall as we commute to our job or school. Um, Etc. cetera, um, you know, we spend a lot of time on pavement in shopping centers. We spend a lot of time looking at our smartphone um, and all. So um, it's hard for us to sort of remember about the real world out there um, that is um, critical. So the broad uh, biogeographic Southeast that the flora of the Southeast project is working on is this. Um, some people might say that Long Island and New Jersey are not part of the Southeast, uh, but um, maybe not culturally, but we contend at least that uh, biologically they are. Um, so Southeastern plant diversity, um, 7,521 native species, or maybe 22 um, or 19, uh, a rich and dynamic biodiversity center um, and really an urgency for us to have better tools for finding and conserving biodiversity. Just a further point about um, our descri description of new biodiversity, about 10% of the native flora of 7,500 species has been described in the last half century. Uh, most of those species are rare, narrowly distributed species that are of conservation concern. And so that process of, of doing taxonomy, understanding what plants are out there, finding out where they are and conserving their habitat is critical. Um, okay, so, um, so I and a team of uh, biologists that I've assembled uh, in Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill and elsewhere um, are working on this. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the group of people involved are much broader. Um, we are uh, very collaborative. We work with um, folks all around the region, um, including many in this room. Um, uh, the, our principle are that the flora should be open access, scientifically rigorous, kept current, supported by diverse funding. Um, our funding and collaborations are, um, are um, complex and uh, diverse. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing is funded by a single anonymous conservation philanthropist who um, believes in these goals um, and is doing great conservation work um, in North Carolina primarily. Uh, but we also have uh, collaborations with federal and state agencies um, across the region, um, for North America Project, iNaturalist, et cetera. Um, and uh, we're working on a variety of kind of um, spin-off projects or derivative or collaborative projects. The Flora of Virginia was one such. Uh, we're, we'll be finishing the Flora of Delaware in the next few months, um, et cetera. So um, core members of the team are these folks. Um, Chris Ludwig, uh, my collaborator with the Flora of Virginia. Um, on the left here, um, he is uh, working almost full-time for us as a, uh, as a contractor. Um, Katie Gibson um, is an app developer out of Bozeman, Montana, um, High Country Apps. Um, she's our app developer. Um, we'll talk about the apps in just a minute. Um, Scott Ward, um, I stole from Archibald Biological Station in Florida. Um, as a botanist, he's doing a lot of the key work and uh, compilation of photos. And then Michael Lee um, in the center here 
is uh, a data scientist. And um, basically we developed this Flora as a database that we can flexibly produce different kinds of product out of. So he's kind of the genius in how we put the data in, how we get the data out um, in uh, a diversity of ways. But then we also work um, across the region. Um, who is that guy on the upper right? I think I've seen him somewhere. Is he in the back? You mean you were younger then? Oh. Anyway, so we work with uh, with biologists um, around the states, um, particularly the Natural Heritage Program uh, botanists who often know the flora of their state better than anybody else, better than any academics, um, et cetera. Um, I would be remiss in not uh, giving a shout out to Janie Marlowe, uh, whose uh, who's work on Name That Plant, uh, you know, is really a, um, has been a, a marvelous, a brilliant uh, uh, piece of compilation of information, putting information out in a way that's understandable to a broad set of people and so forth. It's kind of an inspiration to us. Um, we're going to be talking with uh, with Janie about how to sort of collaborate and cooperate further and um, enhance uh, the work that she's done and that we do um, in a collaborative way. So reinventing the flora as a 21st century um, um, tool for biodiversity inventory. So um, I'm going to move a little quickly through some of this. Um, but how many of you all have keyed out a plant using dichotomous keys? Or tried, okay, I heard that. I, who, who said that? Okay. Um, so not always the most fun experience, right? Is that fair to say? Okay. So um, so we, want, we try to be defined against the saying that keys are written by those who don't need them for those who won't be able to use them. We try to design keys that work throughout the growing season relying only as necessary and as late in the key as possible on transitory characters of flower and fruit. You know, you ought to be able to tell a whole lot just from the leaves of the plant. Um, we try to minimize unnecessary technical language that acts as a barrier to proto-botanists. So, um, molecular, why not just say grooved? Correct, correct, why not say upright? Persisicolor, why not say peach colored? Okay, do you get anything by using those Latin words? No. Um, so uh, we're trying to create a flora by field botanists for field botanists. So, um, will I go through these? Yeah, these are, yeah, why not? So the 22 antitheses of flora writing. So I already read you the first one. Number two, floras are bound books. They should be as heavy as possible and made with weak bindings. They belong on a table in an herbarium, not in the field. Three, digital products are not real. Four, floras should be written once and not revised. Knowledge is eternal. Did Moses need to go back to the mountain for a new set of stone tablets? Floras should be written as dryly as possible. If any touch of humanity or humor appears or love of plants, it degrades the science. No pictures. There's nothing worth showing that can't be described in a minimum of 30 highly technical words. Seven, keep habitat descriptions as general and vague as possible. Woods, roadsides, that way you won't ever be wrong. Eight, make sure to use Latinate words that show you're a well-trained botanist. If a sepal is dark, call it fuscus. If it's grooved, call it follicular or canaliculate. Nine, glossaries of technical terms should have no pictures, making definitions technical and circular, make definitions technical and circular by reference. Volecular, characterized by having a volecula. Ten, if, new genera, if two genera look superficially similar and are often mistaken for one another, make sure they are keyed far apart from one another. Eleven, start keys with the most technical characters possible, then proceed to more obvious, readily observable characters. 12, in keys, never use vegetative characters that are apparent throughout the growing season when you can and should rely on features of the ephemeral flowers or of the fruits that never set. Plants in sterile condition were never meant to be ID'd. 13, in keys, use terms with general meanings, brats, 
without re explaining their specialized meaning in that genus. Brax absent. How do I know that they're absent if I don't know what I'm looking for? 14 in keys use relative terms based on your own extensive experience. Plants large and coarse versus plants smaller and more gracile. Well, how much smaller and what does gracile mean? Perhaps the user will eventually acquire that same experience. 15 in keys use characters that depend on the plant having been dried as an herbarium specimen. Leaves blackening on drying. 16 in keys never use characters that are most apparent when the plant is fresh. Plants should only be ID'd from specimens in an herbarium. 17 in keys use words ambiguously. Sepals reddish brown versus sepals mostly greenish. What does that mostly mean? That most of the sepals, sepal is greenish or that in most of the species that are keyed there, the sepals are greenish, but some of the species have sepals that are reddish brown or maybe flaming hot pink. Right family keys using technical and obscure characters, placentation axile versus placentation parietal often intruded. Follow a strict procedure of key to family, key to genus, key to species. If someone can't key a plant to the family, they don't deserve to know. 20, early in a key use characters requiring mature fruits. Later in the key use characters requiring newly opened flowers. Ha, no pain, no gain. The most common species in a state, crops like wheat, corn, and soybeans should be excluded from floras. That's intuitive, right? And uh, sort of the summary, keep the riffraff out of botany, no PhD, then why do you think you can use a flora? So um, that's all of what we are trying not to do, uh, to be explicit about that. So um, some of what we're also looking at is adding in drawings. So uh, these two fern species, related um, species in the genus Gymnocarpium, this is how you tell them apart, uh, currently in, including in my flora. Cecil basal basoscopic pinnule of the proximal pinny with basal basoscopic pinnulet shorter than the adjacent pinnulet versus Cecil basal basoscopic pinnule of the proximal pinny with basal basoscopic pinnulet more or less equal in length to the adjacent pinnulet. Got it? Okay, so what that means is is seven longer than six, or are they the same length? So why not include a little drawing that shows that? This is the case where a picture is worth maybe not a thousand words, but 30 anyway. Um, so key similar genera directly. How often have you had a hard time with um, uh, Solomon's plume, Solomon's seal, bell warts, um, Mandarin um, and um, Streptopus, just blanked on the name. Twisted stock, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so these are in different families, so they're often, uh, they're keyed way far apart from one another, but what you really need is a key to tell all those apart, right? So that's the way we've tried to structure the keys. So how do we do this? We do this with a database called Flora Manager, and this is a simple diagram of how it works. And this is the more complicated diagram of how it works. And this is why I have a data scientist on the team um, that understands these things because I don't. Um, and this enables us to create uh, what we sometimes call flexifloras or floriolets or floriolas. So anytime, if you have a list of species, if you have a geographic area, we can create on the fly a flora to that area because um, the keys will auto simplify the uh, running it out of a database. We will exclude all the species that are not pertinent. Um, so we can make a flora of a, of a South Carolina heritage preserve. If we have a list of the species that occur in that preserve, we can make a list of of uh, Pickens County, South Carolina. Um, we can make a flora of South Carolina. Um, we can include custom information for that area. So Magnolia of the Southeast uh, is a key like this. Magnolia of Southern Ohio um, uh, simplifies to a much shorter key. Magnolia of Eastern Texas to a much shorter key, but a very different um, shorter key. Um, 
And so this enables us to customize the overall regional flora and make products that are usable um, and, and um, fe feasible for a lot of people to use more flexibly. So um, that business of um, put the hay where the horses can get it to us also means that um, we need to create wildflower guides. Um, I grew up when I was a teenager using wildflower guides and bird guides and things like that. That's kind of the inference way to loving natural history as a kid. Um, you're not gonna pick up a 1500 page flora when you're 10, but you are gonna pick up a wildflower guide. Um, and increasingly, as I said, I think also uh, creating kind of digital products. So the, um, the wildflower guide, which um, there are copies of back on the back table there for sale. Uh, I, I uh, collaborated with uh, Laura Cotterman and Damon Waite at the North Carolina Botanical Garden to, to write that book. Um, it has, um, I think, a lot of nice features about it that uh, make it um, kind of practical and useful. It has kind of a simple key in the beginning that enables one to say, okay, it's not just that I have a plant with yellow flowers and now I'm gonna to turn to these 113 pages of yellow flowers and flip through all those 113 pages and see whether any of the pictures look right. It's, uh, it's uh, based on the idea that it's a yellow flower. Oh, the leaves are opposite. They're simple, they're serrate or entire margined. Very, very simple things that anyone can learn to observe about the plant. Once you've answered just a few simple questions like that, you're down to three pages rather than 113 pages of yellow flowers with opposite leaves and serrate margins of the leaves and so forth. So um, we uh, produce the flora once a year in PDFs uh, that are downloadable for free. Um, we um, put those out each spring. Um, we suggest if you're able to, uh, to make a donation when you download a flora as a way to support the ongoing uh, project. Um, but um, if you um, don't care to or can't afford to make the donation, you um, still have the, the uh, the PDF available. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, downloads, you know, more than we would ever have gotten if we published this as a, well, over 2000 page um, tome is what it would amount to at this point. Um, but we now also have the Floor of the Southeast web app and um, the web address is there. Um, anytime uh, you have web access, which most of us now have most of the time, not everywhere. Um, you can use this, um, this uh, Floor of the Southeast web app. And it has a lot of nifty features. Um, it has uh, basically all of the information available in the PDF, but it also has photographs. Um, it has uh, some kinds of searchability and so forth that you don't, that is clumsy or not available in a PDF, um, et cetera. So, um, you can um, set various things. You can either download all the photos or you can um, have the, it access the photos, um, you know, when you have um, good cell connection only. Um, you can put in four letter acronyms for the plants and, and click search and it'll find everything with that four letter acronym C-O-V-E, which would be things like Collinsia verna, Collinsonia verticillata, Condia verticillata, Conradina verticillata, and Coreopsis verticillata. Um, if you click on one of those, uh, you will get the um, habitat and distribution and, and uh, phenology blooming time, whether it's an endemic or not, the range map, synonymy to other floras. Um, you can click to the, to the genus or click to the family or click to the key. Um, and you have access to the photos. Um, so clicking to the genus, you would get this information. Um, clicking to the key, you would get the key. Um, and um, and the, the species names of the key. Um, whoops. Are, um, are hot linked uh, to the species. 
click on that and it jumps you to co co Colin City of Bratislava. So we are also now developing um, new um, apps, which are uh, apps that are resident on your phone. You buy them once, they update constantly uh, going forward. Um, they um, don't require internet connection and they have some different ID methods uh, plus combinations. So they have what we call a graphic or polyclave or flexible entry key, um, as well as dichotomous keys. Um, and I will explain that graphic key in a minute. They have all the same traditional information, the habitats, the maps of distribution. They also, um, the, the first app that we released was for the northern tier of states, Virginia, Kentucky, north up to Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey. Um, that has 20,000 photos, you know, that are downloaded onto your phone um, and all. Um, we're in, entering in additional information like wetland status, cons, uh, co uh, coefficient of conservatism or floristic quality index values, grasslandiness uh, values, G ranks, et cetera, onto, into those apps um, and all. So the app looks like this. Um, so this is the Northern Tier app that covers the, that set of states. So there's a, um, a, an opening page that gives you various things. Um, you can um, configure the app to uh, cover that entire area or to cover only the state that you're interested in or to cover only the province uh, of that state that you're interested in. So you could configure it to, you know, I'm in the coastal plain of Delaware. I'm just going to click the coastal plain of Delaware on. Then everything further you do with that app excludes all the species that are not known to occur in the coastal plain of Delaware. So it simplifies um, the set of species that you're looking at at the expense potentially of, you know, you might find some plan in the coastal plain of Delaware that's never been documented for that, right? So, so that's the, um, the, um, the, the negative potential side of that. The graphic key works by you select a major group of plants like ferns and fern allies or grass-like plants, this set of things. Um, you click on it and, um, and it immediately basically subsets to that set of species. Um, it then asks you a series of questions like about habitat or, you know, is it in a sunny place? Is it wet or dry? Um, if you happen to have a guess as to whether it's native or non-native, if you know what family or genus it's in, if it's blooming in March, you click whatever information you have. If there's any piece of that information that you don't have, you don't have to click it. So that's a major difference between a dichotomous key. Those of you who have had frustrating times with dichotomous keys, probably one of the reasons for that frustration is you come to some choice and it says, are the fruits, fruits red or blue? And it's in flower, right? So you don't have the fruits. So. Um, this may, allows you to enter in whatever information you have. Every time you enter in information, the app is acting as a computer and it's sorting through a database that we have populated that says, okay, if you have a composite, an aster plant in a moist place and it's in partial shade, it's native and it's blooming in March, there are only 15 possibilities. Time you add an additional piece of information, it's going to reduce that number of possibilities. So if you're in an unglaciated place in Montaigne, Pennsylvania, it's wet, it's a broadleaf woody plant, it's a shrub rather than a tree, the leaves are opposite, the leaves are compound, you've gone from 10,800 possibilities to two. And you can look at then look at those two. So this is enabled by us developing this traits database that supports the graphic key and for other uses. So it's a lot of work uh, to develop this kind of key. So um, once you get to a potential answer, um, you, you can uh, jump to the key. Um, you can uh, look at the possibilities. The more common possibilities with the green little arrow here are at the top of the list. The less common ones um, will be lower. Um, you can click to the plant and see pictures of it to confirm it, and you can see the, um, the information about it. 
You can also see the breadcrumbs of the characteristics that are in the graphic key um, for the plant and um, other information about it. So some other things that the app has are great places to botanize. So um, where do you wanna go see plants? Um, so for the Northeastern app, we have 60 or 70 places to uh, go see a diversity of plants. Um, so um, it has all these various features. I'm running out of time, but I just have a few more slides. So the print, uh, print flora um, has these various features. The PDF flora has these. The web app has these. The mobile app has these. So there's sort of different pros and cons of these different formats. And we think by basically providing the flora in all of these formats, um, we best enable people to customize their experience to choose their poison um, or hopefully dessert um, and um, explore plants um, hopefully um, very effectively. So you can take your 6.388 pound floor of Virginia out in the field or you can take your smartphone um, and you know if you're missing the weight you can um, you can put a weight in your pack right? Um, so um, with that, I, I'm going to close, uh, but offer uh, to answer any questions or comments you may have, uh, but I'll just highlight a couple uh, additional things here. So um, I would love to hear from any of you all, what would you like to see in your floras? Um, you know, we're uh, designing these, developing these in a dynamic way. We want it to meet um, you know, the needs and wants and likes of all y'all. Um, the web app um, is at the address shown there. The Florida Flora PDF downloads are at the address shown there, or you can get to any of this by um, Googling the North Carolina uh, Botanical Garden, uh, doing a web search for that. Um, the uh, purchasable app, uh, the FloraQuest app, the Northern Tier uh, version um, is uh, available. We uh, came out in May. Um, it's almost 20 bucks, uh, which is a lot for an app, but not more than you pay for like bird apps and other things. And it's a lot less than you would pay for a 1500 page book. Um, the next one that we're going to release is the Carolinas and Georgia, um, should be available in early 2024. So that's really just around the corner, five, six months from now. Um, I'm not promising which month. Uh, it'll, I think, be also priced at $19.99. So you can get that at, uh, at Google Play or the App Store, depending on the operating system of your, um, of your phone or tablet um, and all. And I'll also invite people to join the Weekly's Flora uh, Facebook group. Uh, for updates and um, and general southeastern U.S. plant news and posts, um, I think it right now has about five thousand one hundred members or so. Um, a lot of good stuff gets posted there um, by um, a variety of folks. So with that, I will um, finish and and be happy to answer any questions. And I'll, I'll also um, after questions are done, I'll be around for uh, a little bit longer if people want to. Uh, come up and uh, ask something or whatever. So, thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we go up to the northern border of Pennsylvania. We don't go all the way up into New England, New York and New England. So we exclude New York and New England, um, except for Long Island, New York, which is coast as a northern extension of the coastal plain. 
Um, so yeah, it cuts off at the Pennsylvania border. Keith. Yeah, um, so that's something we have thought about a little bit and haven't explored deeply, but um, I think it's something we will explore over the next year. So you and I should talk further about that. Um, we're also, um, we've had some requests uh, by heritage programs of, wouldn't it be great if you could include for our, you know, basically our tracking list for our state, you know, so that basically it's like, okay, I, I did Carrick's Red 40, I, oh, I'm, and I'm in South Carolina, that's on their tracking list, um, you know, hyperlinked to the South Carolina Heritage Field Forum, uh, et cetera. So yeah, I think that would be a brilliant thing for us to program in, and I think it's pretty, pretty simple to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so we collaborate with South Carolina Heritage. Uh, uh, Keith and his uh, staff have been sending us great information and so forth. So they're a part of that, uh, that larger group of hundreds of people that we collaborate with. We haven't had any direct um, financial relationship with, uh, with South Carolina state government or heritage program in terms of, of funding. We have had that with a few other heritage programs, um, Arkansas, uh, Georgia, uh, Delaware, um, et cetera, where uh, they find this so useful that they're you know, they're um, asking us to um, customize things for their state in ways that go beyond what we're sort of doing across the whole region. So, you know, we're open to those kinds of relationships, um, uh, but haven't, don't have that yet with South Carolina. Anything else? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, thanks everyone. Well, you're welcome. It means a whole lot. So, uh, people are not proud. So.